Yes. Yeah. So uh, this uh, this the first module is going to be on crystal structures and electron materials. So the main thing that we want to get out of this um, chapter is just a little bit about the uh, the types of atomic structures of uh, semiconductor devices. Um, just to note, we're not going to be doing um, we're going to be skipping over a few things in this module, just because I found that in past semesters. We always get very rushed at the end, so I'm going to try to move a little bit quickly through the earlier material so that we have more time at the end of the class. Uh, so the purpose of this module is to understand the crystal structures and materials, in other words, how atoms are arranged in solid materials, and how to analyze and classify crystal structures, and uh, specifically the crystal structures of semiconductors. And uh, finally, we'll talk a little bit about crystals and how semiconductor wafers are manufactured. We used to do some um, exercises with uh, um, calculating the volumetric and area densities. Let's see if we get to those or not. Uh, so this is these are the three types of solids. How many of you have seen this type of thing before? Crystalline, amorphous, and polycrystalline. Yes. So uh, what is your name? Uh, Syed, but I go by that name. Abid. 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 Okay. Abid. So um, what do you know about? Um, I mean, amorphous versus crystalline materials. I just remember, I'm familiar, I just remember studying it back in like, like, way more science and science. Okay. From a fire scale. Yeah. But I'm familiar with this now. Okay. Uh, did you guys talk about this in the PDG? So, what, what's the difference between an amorphous and a uh, uh, crystalline material? Random. Yeah, the atoms are in kind of like a random format. Whereas in a crystalline material, they're in a very well arranged, uh, ordered lattice. Okay, the lattice is just the, the structure of the atoms inside the material. Uh, the, the crystalline material is defined by a repeating arrangement of atoms, and the amorphous material is, is defined by a random arrangement of atoms. Okay, so the amorphous material is defined by the amorphous material is something in between. In other words, it has regions of crystallinity represented by the regions of the So the crystalline, there's a bunch of like crystalline parts that are in someone's cell smashed up together. So it has both crystalline and non-crystalline parts. Or in other words, better way of saying it, regions of crystallinity separated by the same corporeal boundaries. Because that happens um, where the crystalline, um, the periodic structure does not repeat itself. Um, this is what it might actually look like. Uh, on the right side here, these are things that both CD and NAD. Transmission electron microscopy. Uh, the TEM is you know, probably the highest resolution microscope that we have. Um, this image, I believe, was taken at, um, I think it may have been taken at the TEM. No, no, no. This image is happening at the TEM here. I'm going to skip the link so you don't have one. Um, TEMs are special types of microscopes which use which use electrons for imaging. They shoot electrons into the material. The, the electrons actually go through the material, and then they're imaged on the other side. They measure uh, how the uh, electrons scatter through the material, and then they form an image on the opposite side. You have to create a very very thin slice of the material, um, and then you have to have a very well controlled electron stream of electrons that are shooting through. It's um, it's a pretty complex type of uh, topic. I mean, not really my area of expertise, but um, what it allows you to do is it allows you to get very, very high resolution images uh, where you can actually see down to the atomic scale. So these are actually these dots that you see there are actually visual objects. Yeah, it does work. Is, is that okay? Or are we all going to fall asleep? <laughs> okay. I can't see it. Yeah, okay. You should, yeah, go ahead and turn it off. If, we, if people start snoozing, I'll turn it back on. Okay. I'll wake them up. <laughs> So can everyone see these white dots here? Group of individual atoms. Uh, we didn't have these tools 20 years ago. So the beautiful thing is we can actually see crystal structures now. Before people had to just predict whether the crystal structure was there or, or not. Now we can actually see it with the high resolution microscope of these atoms. So this is the difference between crystal silicon and amorphous silicon. You can see it's amorphous silicon. You can still see the dots, but the dots are all like randomly arranged and clumped together. So um, uh, 
this is what the physical material will look like. Um, what have you learned in your mechanical engineering courses about um, physical and versus amorphous material? What kind of mechanical properties would an amorphous material have versus a crystalline material? Um, that's correct. The, the crystalline material is more brittle. So if you take a crystalline material and you break it, it usually breaks along those crystal boundaries, right? Like salt crystals, for example. If you break salt, it turns into like a smaller, breaks up into smaller uh, crystals of salt. Okay. Uh, uh, crystalline materials are typically brittle, and they typically break along the crystal planes. Amorphous materials, on the other hand, they break randomly. Um, an example of a, um, an amorphous material might be a plastic. Okay, um, so plastics are they can be flexible. Amorphous material, metals can be uh, amorphous materials. Metals are ductile, they can be stretched out. Um, sort of a conflicting one is glass. Did you guys know that glass is a, actually an amorphous material? But glass is brittle. Okay, so the rule doesn't always apply. But just in, in um, often in uh, uh, when we talk about mechanical properties, it's 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 common that many types of crystal materials are typically brittle. Anyway, um, the reason we're talking about this here in this class is that um, the uh, uh, just like the atomic structure determines. Uh, the mechanical properties of the material, the atomic structure can also determine the electronic properties of the material. Um, so, one of the points I want to make here is that a predictable crystal structure results in predictable properties, right? If you have a re repeating atomic structure, then you would have uh, repeatable uh, properties, both mechanical properties and electrical properties. So, if we look at these two, which one of these two materials is going to have a more predictable behavior? The crystalline material. That's right. Um, so, which material do you think would be better for making microprocessors out of? That's right. Was that a sneeze, or did you actually say something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yes, that's correct. Crystal material will have more predictable properties, so it actually makes sense to make microprocessors out of um, uh, crystalline materials. <clears throat> um, so this is, this is important. We have to make our microprocessors out of crystalline silicon. Um, first of all, the reason why repeatability is very important in microprocessors, in a microprocessor chip that's about this big, we have, I mentioned, sometimes they have up to a billion transistors on them, right? Um, if the property of the transistor on this corner of the chip is different than the property of the transistor just uh, like 100 nanometers away, if all the transistors on the chip have different properties, it would be impossible for the circuit designer to actually, you know, make a circuit that works, right? You have to have very, very repeatable properties over when you're making such large-scale integrated devices. It's important to use uh, things with repeatable properties. But the, the challenge that it makes is that crystalline silicon is... Um, uh, it's a little bit harder to make than amorphous silicon. We'll talk a little bit about how crystalline silicon is made. All the processes have to be done in a very controlled manner as well in order to maintain the uh, repeatable properties. Um, so when we're talking about crystalline materials, we talk about unit cells. We're not going to spend too much time on this, just enough so that you know a little bit about what silicon is like. The smallest repeating unit uh, is, is called a, um, a unit cell. In most crystalline materials, there's three basic types of unit cells. There's something called a simple cubic, there's something called a body centered cubic, and then there's something called a face centered cubic. In the simple cubic cell, uh, you have eight atoms, each atom at the, uh, at the corner of a cube. Okay, and this structure repeats itself. In the body centered cubic unit cell, it's it looks very much like a simple cubic, except we also have an extra atom right in the middle. And in the third case, we have a face centered cubic, where we have, uh, we start off with a simple cubic, and then on each 
things of the key, we have uh, one extra atom. So how many atoms, how many extra atoms does the phase center cubic have compared to the simple cubic? Six extra ones. One extra one on each phase. That's correct. Uh, if you want to go through, you can um, actually look at some of these links and uh, you'll be able to see some of the, um, uh, what these things look like in 3D. Um, I will um, not show these ones, I'll uh, jump ahead when we look at the silicon crystals. But these are, uh, most crystalline materials have these types of unit cells. These aren't the only ones, but these are very common. So when we say a crystalline material has a repeating um, it's a periodic lattice, meaning a repeating lattice. The smallest unit of the repetition is called a, a unit cell. So if you just imagine one of these just like stacked next to each other, then that's what the uh, material will look like. Now let's take a look at the periodic table. So where do semiconductor materials fall? Well, um, in the, in the periodic table, you know, you have all these uh, columns, columns 2 through 8. Uh, but we're focused in on columns 2 through 6 in the periodic table. Uh, most semiconductors are made up of, uh, the, the simple semiconductors, the elemental ones, are made up of materials that are in column 4. So, this part of the table. Carbon, silicon, and germanium. Um, all of these, you, it is possible to make semiconductors out of carbon. Okay, the silver diamond electronics does that. Silicon is by far the most common one. And then germanium is also, um, is also used for making semiconductor devices. Uh, so these are the elemental uh, transistors. Elemental semiconductors are made up. Or column four uh, they're also used in infrared and nuclear uh, detectors. Let's talk about the elemental. Uh, just a quick review of um, Did anyone, anyone, everyone remember the uh, Lewis diagram, the Scott diagram? So if we were to draw, if we were to draw the dot diagram for silicon, column four elements. What does that tell us about the element? There's four electrons in the outer shell. There's the valence electrons, the outer shell electrons. Column four elements means that there's four electrons in the outer shell. So we draw four dots around the element. This is called the dot diagram. In order for an atom to be stable, how many electrons does it need to have in the outer shell? Eight. Now, um, you guys have probably seen something like this: hydrogen, and then let's say chlorine. Chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell. So, what hi hydrogen has one electron. So what happens in this type of bond, the hydrogen actually donates an electron into this. So the chlorine then is happy to make eight electrons in its outer shell, and this is what the system will look like. This becomes a hydrogen ion because it lost an electron, and the chlorine becomes a negatively charged ion. Right, these, two, uh, these two things actually, if you have a solution of hydrogen chloride, does anyone know what that is, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> Um, the hydrogen and chlorine atoms actually dissociate from each other in, in the solution. They're actually separate from each other. Okay. This is one type of um, uh, bond that can form. But uh, what happens in a uh, uh, silicon, this type of atom, is that we form the bonds where electrons are actually shared between atoms. Does anyone know what type of bond they're called? They're called covalent bonds. Okay. So what, what happens in silicon? And they will bind. Let's say we have a bunch of silicon atoms around this. Each silicon atom has four electrons in the outer shell. 
In order to make the atoms happy, they have to have the electrons outside of the cell. So totally electron bonds is something like this. And what happens is that the silicon will form electrons that will form a covalent bond here. They'll form a covalent bond here. It'll form a covalent bond here, and it'll form a covalent bond here. It forms the covalent bond with four silicon atoms around it. What is the covalent bond? This electron belongs to this silicon atom, and then this electron belonging to the neighboring silicon atom are shared. These electrons are bonded together. They form a covalent bond with four silicon uh, when it would be sort of going to the next unit. Uh, this forms uh, something called an FCC hybrid orbital, where these electrons are actually both parts of the same orbital. And this orbital actually connects these two atoms together. In three dimensions, it actually looks like it's looking like this. We'll see this again uh, in the next module. It looks something like a tripod. It's sort of take four sticks out of the, uh, the central silicon atom and put uh, and arrange them in such a way that the angle between those four sticks is at a maximum. So these four atoms are as far apart from each other as possible. Then you'll get this thing called the tetrahedral bond, and uh, the angle here is about 100 degrees. This is called the tetrahedral bond. Any type of column four element will form this kind of uh, bond. It forms covalent bonds with other silicon atoms or other column four elements. And, um, you know, this would continue on this way. So this silicon atom would also have silicon atoms around it. And this would form covalent bonds around it. So each silicon atom is bound to four of the silicon atoms around it. Yes? I, yes, it's 109 degrees. Yes, it's an element. It's, it's symmetric. So this is all the same angle in all one of them. Yeah. Ah, the egg one. Yes. They will. They will. Um, so the surface silicon bond, this is actually this part you bring up. The surface silicon bond is that the silicon atoms on the surface are essentially a little bit more reactive. You can actually grow, um, you can actually grow insulating on top of the silicon, which is one of the really nice properties of it. Just by placing it in a sort of silicon outside, which is a very nice insulator. That's a form of these materials of moss. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later. That's a good question. Um, so column four element, that's the way that a column four element will form, uh, will form a crystal lattice. Um, with other silicon atoms. Uh, okay. Other types of materials. Um, you can also have 3-5 material. Now, with 3-5 semiconductor material, you will um, take one atom from column 3 and one atom from column 5. And this will also form uh, a semiconductor material. Or it will also form covalent bonds. So let's see. This one. Uh, you pick a column three element, let's pick a common one. Gallium arsenide is uh, a very uh, common 3 5 compound. So we have gallium here. Gallium is a column three element, so gallium has three electrons inside itself. And then arsenide has five atoms in its Five atoms in its atoms. And we'll talk about the, what the lattice structure looks like, looks like, but each um, gallium arsenide semiconductor, uh, every arsenide atom is surrounded by three gallium atoms. And then each gallium atom is surrounded by four arsenide atoms. It's, it's an alternating light. So, let's see if we can figure out how this works. Uh, Arsenide has uh, five electrons on its outer shell, and Valium has uh, three electrons on its outer shell. So, um, 
young and eager. This R is now added as contributing one uh, here. This R is now added as contributing one 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 here. Is that right? This value right up here. And this R is not added as contributing one 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 there. And this R that I have is actually contributing two. So in the end, this value matter is still happy as these electrons run. And similarly, um, each arc that I have is supplying one electron to the neighboring gallium atom. But if one of the gallium atoms is actually supplying one electron. They're still covalent bonds. Um, you know, if you had, if every atom has four electrons on its outer shell, then by forming covalent bonds in the atoms with the electrons are here, you can make um, you can make sure that all atoms have effectively eight electrons and therefore completing its outer shell. You can do the same thing if you choose a three column three element with a column five element. And you can also do this case where you have a column two element with a column six element. Okay, as long as it adds up to eight. Uh, these bonds will form, and you'll have uh, the atoms will be happy. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, these different types of tension connectors are used in, in various types of applications. Uh, uh, elemental semiconductors like silicon are used in traditional blisters and microprocessors and typical integrated circuits, and it's used in these types of detectors. Uh, three five devices are um, often. Uh, high-speed devices used in high-speed communication uh, electronics or high-speed detectors used for scientific or military applications. Um, these are also devices requiring the emission and absorption of light. Um, silicon, for example, doesn't emit light. So you'll never see an LED made out of silicon. But you will see LEDs made out of gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, like I mentioned earlier. Um, gallium Aluminum gallium arsenide is the red LED. Uh, I, th I think aluminum gallium nitride is the blue LED. So these examples are um, actually what's called tertiary uh, semiconductors, where you have um, what's it, two different types of atoms from column three, and then one atom from column five. And you have to mix them at the right ratio to form a crystal. So those are tertiary um, uh, semiconductors. We're not talking about those here. Uh, two six compounds, the ones that have column two and column six, uh, those are used in, in uh, phosphor, the fluorescent materials used in your uh, TV screens. Um, they're also used in a lot of uh, biotechnology type applications. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about that. There's different types of semiconductors, so you have, you can you choose the different types of semiconductors depending on your um, application. Yes? Question. The question is, um, if we have an, um, we have, ele if we want to make an elemental semiconductor, we can make them out of column four elements. So why do we use silicon? Why don't we just use carbon? Carbon is, is abundantly available also. Um, when we make semiconductors out of carbon, they have a very large band gap. Whereas with silicon, um, if we compare the band gap, uh, carbon-based electronics would have a band gap of four electron volts. Silicon would have a band gap of like 1.12 electron volts. You're probably wondering what a band gap is. We'll talk about that in the, I'm sorry? Yeah, it's the energy between the valence and the conduction band. This will all make sense two chapters from now. Uh, so when you have a very large band gap, that makes um, the semiconductor very resistive. The, the resist resistivity is very high. So, so for that reason, we don't always use <coughs> large band gap semiconductors. But one of the advantages of large band gap semiconductors is that they can be used in high temperature applications. So there's some research going on in, in um, carbon-based or diamond-based uh, electronics and um, for use in high temperature type applications. So we're, here we're talking about carbon in uh, three-dimensional lattices. Okay. If we replaced silicon with carbon in, in that thing, we'd form a three-dimensional carbon lattice, and that is diamond. Um, 
What people are also looking at, though, is two-dimensional and one-dimensional materials. For example, Professor Cheng, he works on graphene. Graphene is actually a two-dimensional lattice of carbon atoms instead of a three-dimensional lattice. Uh, graphene is, is becoming a very popular material which can make, um, which has a band gap of zero, which means that it's almost like a metal. Um, and graphene is, as I mentioned in the last class, it's used for to make metal interconnects and it's used for, um, it's also transparent and flexible, so it can be used for flexible display electronics and things like that. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, so moving on, since we're talking about the, the silicon lattice, it, it forms something called the diamond ladder. Uh, let's see if we can. Oh, we can't download. In order to view this, we need uh, we need to download the viewer first. Uh, what I would suggest is if you want to see this model being rotated in three dimensions, uh, I would um, I would download the viewer and then like click on the link. You'll just be able to move the, uh, the lattice around and see what it looks like. Uh, just in the interest of time, I don't think we're going to be going into um, the specifics of the diamond lattice, but this is the basic idea. Every silicon atom is connected to four silicon atoms around it. Um, and we'll see the bond and the If you take that structure, the basic structure, and repeat it, um, the smallest repeating unit that you'll find into something called the diamond lattice. Uh, what the, the diamond lattice looks like, you start off with a cube, and you have your eight atoms, one of each corner of the cube. In addition to that, you have six atoms, one on each face of the cube. And then inside the cube, you have four additional atoms. And then if you're going to repeat that again, you have eight atoms, one on each corner, then you have six additional atoms, one in the middle of each face of the cube. And in the middle, inside the cube, you have four additional atoms. Okay, this is the smallest repeating unit uh, when you have such a weaker bond like that. This is called uh, a diamond lattice, appropriately because you know, diamond is, is one material that has this, this lattice structure. Um, any questions on the diamond lattice? Yes? The four atoms that are inside, that's a good question. The four atoms that are inside, they're not in the middle of the cube, they're not right in the middle. They're actually one in each uh, quadrant. If you imagine that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, within this cube, there's eight subcubes. Four of those cubes have an atom inside. And the other four subcubes are empty. The zinc blend lattice is like the diamond lattice. The only exception is that you'll notice that you have two different colors here, which means that you're always alternating between one atom and the other. So, in the case of gallium arsenide, you're always alternating between gallium and arsenide. So, every arsenide atom would have four gallium atoms around it, and every gallium atom would have four arsenide atoms around it. This is sort of schematically shown here in, the, in, the, in this image. You see we have the large yellow ball and then we have the smaller blue ball. The smaller atoms are the gallium atoms and the larger ones are the arsenide atoms. You can see that the, they're always alternating between the gallium and arsenide. There has to be an equal number of them. So when you grow gallium arsenide crystals, you actually have to be putting in the right concentrations of those uh, materials in order to get these types of organized uh, lattice structures to form. <coughs> so this is called a zinc blend lattice. Um, it's, it's pretty much the same as a diamond lattice, except we have alternating atoms. Just a terminology. So this is something that we're going to skip over this term. Um, one thing you can do is calculate the volume density. Uh, you can basically figure out the number of atoms per centimeter cubed in a material. Um, just in the interest of time, we're going to kind of uh, skip over that because it's not too important in the, um, the whole thing about uh, solid state.
So we can also talk about the different families of planes in a cubic lattice. Um, this is a lot of material science. But if we take that, um, if we take that diamond lattice, if we take a block of silicon, we can actually cut it in a lot of different ways. We can cut it vertically, we can cut it horizontally, we can even cut it at a specific angle. And what's interesting is that depending on what angle you cut the block of silicon, you'll have a different density of atoms on the surface. Uh, for example, if you were to cut just cut the uh, cut the tip horizontally like this, you'll have a certain density of atoms on the surface. And if you cut it at a longer one one plane, you'll have a very higher density of atoms. Because of that, silicon has different electrical properties depending on which plane that you cut the silicon. Different mechanical properties, different chemical properties, and so on. We don't deal with that too much in this class, but it's, it's useful for you to know for future uh, reference. We talked about last time in class why we want to use, um, why we use silicon. Well, silicon is, comes from sand, so uh, the economic reason for using silicon is that it's a very abundant material, very easy to obtain. Um, but easy to obtain doesn't mean easy to make. We start with sand. From sand, we actually have to take, uh, we have to take uh, uh, the sand and make it into single crystal silicon. This is the tricky part. This is one of the reasons why um, silicon is not, um, you know, it's not a super expensive material compared to other things, but it's not, it's not cheap either. <coughs> sand is silica. So it has silicon atoms in it, but it also has oxygen atoms in it. We have to take the uh, silica and we, the first thing which is done is that silica is converted into a polysilicon melt using the process. And that melt is then uh, formed into an ingot uh, of pure silicon atoms. And we'll talk about this in the next slide. This is one of the very important processes that was necessary for semiconductors to become very, um, semiconductor manufacturing to become very modern. So this is silica. And this is a block of single crystal, pure, ultra high purity purity silicon. And you'll notice that it's reflected. It's actually pure silicon is actually, um, uh, it's, it's crystalline, it's kind of brittle, um, and it's also uh, um, reflected. From here, you have to take this long cylinder, which is called an ingot, and you slice it up into wafers. Have you guys seen these before? These things are like circular. Okay. Does anyone? No? Okay. Um, these are what uh, uh, your computer chips are made of. This is the starting point. This is single crystal silicon, which is in the three dimensional, like a cylinder form. Um, but we cut that up into these thin wafers, made from some of boxes of 25. They can be this big, they can be this big, it can even be the size of a pizza. Uh, most of the uh, big fast ones are regular large wafer sizes. So why do we do this? Well, when we make transistors, most of the transistors are fabricated right on top, on the top surface of the wafer. Okay. Probably within the first 10 micro micrometers of the wafer. Okay. These micrometers are maybe like um, you know, 500 microns thick. So, uh, if the transistors are being made just within the surface of the wafer, there's no point in using a big block of silicon um, and just making the uh, transistors on top and the rest of the silicon would be wasted, right? So that's the reason why the silicon is cut into thin slices and every, all the transistors that you see are going to be formed just on the top surface of the wafer. Um, any, any questions? Please feel free to stop me if any, you know, if any of this is not uh, enough. Going from here to here is where a lot of the magic happens. Oh, I forgot to mention, in order to um, cut these things up, we need something called a dicing saw. So there's a saw that cuts these, but when you cut it, obviously it's going to be 
um, is not going to be a smooth surface. So they use something called chemical mechanical polishing to make a very, very smooth surface. This is because the transistor network that they're going to make are maybe um, well, like 25 nanometers in size, which is the state of the art. So if you have corrugations, if you have any kind of dirt on there, if it's not a smooth surface, then um, your, uh, your fabrication processes, the transistors themselves, uh, will fail because the manufacturing is not reliable. These have to be almost atomically smooth on one side, right? Because to say these wafers are polished, they're polished on one side. Then the next step, actually not not one step, but this consists of um, 36 primary steps, but altogether like over 200 steps, 200 individual uh, uh, process steps. Um, these process steps involve things like photolithography. They involve um, dry etching, plasma etching. They involve the deposition of metals. They involve diffusion for form, form like p type material or n type material when you don't use a semiconductor. Um, they also involve furnace operations where you grow um, you grow insulators on the uh, on silicon to make insulating agents. Um, a whole bunch of different processes which you guys are going to learn about in the tinkering lab. Uh, towards the end of the semester. When all these steps are done, you have made, um, on a single wafer, you've probably made um, several hundred microprocessors. So the chips are about this big, right? So you see these little squares on here? Each one of these squares represents one microprocessor. And each microprocessor contains maybe anywhere from 10 million a billion uh, transistors. So the transistors themselves are very, 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 very tiny. Uh, the reason why this is shiny in different colors is because you have, um, whenever you make thin films, like whether they're insulators or metal, they reflect light in different patterns. You know, they, they'll appear to be different colors. So um, this appears different colors because there's a, a bunch of different metal lines on it which connect the transistors together. There are um, uh, thin films, which are either insulated and then there's the um, insulating region and then the dark region and so on. It looks very pretty, but anyway, each one of these squares becomes a microprocessor. So you can imagine that a full wafer after it's made is quite valuable. <laughs> you know, if you're selling each microprocessor at, you know, 200 bucks a pop, um, and you may have several hundred of these microprocessors, these wafers can quite valuable uh, uh, by the time you're done. Now what you do at this point is that you take a knife and saw again, you slice the stops this way, and you slice it up this way, um, and so you get your each one of the individual chips, and each one of those individual chips are packed into um, one of these packages. Do you know what the purpose of this package is? Mm -hmm. Yes, the package is just for the chips, correct. Um, and the second part of the package is that this this thing is what plugs into your um, motherboard on your computer. If you were to look at a microscope image of one of these microprocessors, you'd see that there's a bunch of um, metal tabs and other off tabs. All the circuit stuff in the middle here, but along the outside you have these metal tabs, metal tabs, and these are what you to make electrical connections into your microprocessor. So the package will actually have, um, will actually provide all these electrical connections into the microprocessor. It'll have an aluminum region on which it serves the heat, and, and then you mount your fan on that top of it, and then it keeps your microprocessor cool. Uh, cooling is very important because uh, silicon can only work up to 200 Celsius. Uh, beyond that, it will not work anymore. The semiconductor starts to fail. We'll talk about why that might happen. Yes, Robert. Um, why did they take the pins off of the processor and start putting them on the motherboard? Why did they take uh, the pins off the microprocessor and put them on the motherboard instead? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Sorry. Uh, 
I, I will mention one other thing, though, that some of the recent versions of the microprocessors, instead of having um, instead of having to pass the thread on the outside, you'll have what's called a slip chip, um, a ball of dirt, or a this little box of solder. They literally look like small metal balls. And these work for the microprocessor, will be here at the heart of the solder, the ball of the beads, and these will be put directly on. The, the package. This is called the ball of It's a little bit higher density and a little bit more reliable than what they used to do with these uh, direct wire modules. Uh, anyway, like we're going to be focusing on, we're going to be learning a little bit about this process, and then in the two years lab, we'll learn about this, uh, this part of the process. Um. This type of processing started in the 1960s and, uh, and 70s, I would say, and it has been going for the last 30 years. And this process, as you can imagine, over 30 or 40 years, if you have such a huge industry working on it, it, it is really a perfected and a very mature process. So we're able to make these microchips very reliably, and the economies have gotten to the point where the economies of scale have gotten to the point where we can start making these things very uh, cheaply, so you have very, very sophisticated functions in these um, in these small chips, um, largely due to the advances in the manufacturing and the semiconductor technology. Um, any questions on on this? Yes. Uh, this part of it? Ah, yes, yes. That's that's a good point. Yeah, when you make these wafers, um, uh, these wafers are circular. They would like to, um, you can't make them square because a lot of the processes require you to spin, uh, to spin these uh, chips, I'm sorry, spin the wafers around at high speeds. And for that, if what you're doing is you're actually spinning them and you're putting, um, you're dropping a liquid material on there and that liquid material spreads evenly across it. If you had a square wafer instead of a circular wafer, it, would, um, it wouldn't be even, it wouldn't disperse evenly. So the wafers have to be circular, but the chips that we sell are square. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely right. What ends up happening is that all these devices on the edge actually get thrown out. Yeah. And that's actually, that's actually a lot of them. <laughs> um, but, but to actually spring or whatever that spring is, that's one of the things called spring. Uh, that's called photoresist. It's part of the, it's part of the process. It's, um, uh, it's not that it's that expensive, it's that, that it has to be spread very uniformly across the wafer or else the photolithography processes won't work. So it's more the uniformity than, than the cost of it. Uh, w wasting money in what sense? They're not really wasting money, they're just not making Yeah, th you're you're losing. You are losing these ones on the corner, but I mean that's factored into the cost of making making the wafer. The thing is, like one of the reasons why you can buy microcontrollers for just like ten dollars, you buy a you know microcontroller with like maybe ten million transistors on them just for a few bucks, is because the amount of space that that microcontroller takes up on this wafer is so tiny. Those microcontrollers might might actually be only a few millimeters by a few millimeters. They take up an incredibly small amount of space on here. So in one wafer, you could produce maybe like tens of thousands of them. Okay, that's what allows you to sell them cheap because um, you, you have a, a whole ton of them that you've made. On the other hand, if you have a larger microprocessor, like, um, like a Core i7 that has a lot of RAM in it, it has a lot of, um, you know, it has multiple cores on it, so it has a lot more transistors on it, it takes up more space, you can only fit a fewer of them fewer of them on a wafer. So that's why they're more expensive. So the cost of a microcontroller is proportional to how much area it takes up on one of these wafers. Um, you know, and some of these, uh, you can also make digital camera CCD imagers out of the similar photolithographic technologies. And in those cases, um, the imager themselves, that one, one single chip might be almost the size of the wafer. That's why those are so expensive. Um, does anyone do digital photography here? 
Anyone have a digital camera? Well, the <laughs> you have a. Hmm? Do you have one of the SLR cameras? Yeah, right, right, right. So one of the reasons why those cameras are so expensive is because if you look at, if you were to look inside, if you were to compare the um, the electronic chip that you have inside your, you know, your your phone camera, the you know, the imaging chip might be only about this thick, it'd be really tiny. But if you look in, in, in these professional cameras, the imaging chip is like this big. It takes up a lot more real estate on the, on the wafer. That's why they're more expensive to buy. Um, but you get the performance benefit because the larger the imaging chip, the CCD sensor, the larger it is, the bigger the pixels, the more light they're able to collect. So they have much better performance. The quality of the image comes out better. Anyway, that's a sort of a different topic. But yeah, the point I want to make here is that, that when you buy a, a chip, you're actually the cost of the chip is proportional to how much area it takes up. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the first step here. This is called the Trolsky method. If we want to make one of these ingots, this is the picture of an ingot that you see here. The first step in silicon um, uh, microchip fabrication is making this ingot. This is just a schematic that shows how it works. First, we melt uh, polysilicon. Polysilicon is, you know, silicon atoms that's not in a crystalline form. They're just in a, you know, a polycrystal form. We talked about what polycrystal is. So what you do is you melt this down first, and okay, so you have like a liquid um, pot of silicon. And um, this means you have to heat it up to like over a thousand degrees because that's what the um, the melting point of silicon is. It's be very hot. Um, and then what you do is you introduce a seed crystal. And this is one of those things where in order to form a crystal, you actually have to start with a crystal. So your seed crystal goes in there, and then um, you dip it into the melt, and then you turn it. It's, it's on, a, on a rotating thing. So as you're rotating it, you slowly pull this thing out. So what happens is when you put this, a crystal in there, the silicon atoms in the melt start to attach to it. But it starts to attach to it in a very reliable way. Meaning, like, you know, if you have, let's say you start it off with this, the other silicon, another silicon atom would attach to here, and then a couple more, so it forms a complete bond, then another one attaches. Okay. So, if you start, if you have a, crystal, a seed crystal to start with, you can build up uh, a, a larger crystal, and it does this in a very reproducible way. Um, this has been perfected, of course, over a very, very long time. So, what they do is when they rotate it, it just keeps the process going evenly, and it, um, the crystal that's formed forms a cylinder. Otherwise, it would just form a you know, random shape and cracking pattern. As you're rotating it, you pull the seed crystal out, um, and then it forms basically, you know, as long as you keep the rotation rate constant and you keep the, the rate at which you're pulling it out constant, it will end up forming this cylinder. And that cylinder will be single crystal. Um, uh, nowadays in the industry, they make you know, very, very tall ingots um, that can be done at a large scale. And they're also, they also make very large diameter ingots too, so that you can pack more um, microprocessors and microcontrollers in the, in, on a single wafer. Uh, you can watch these videos if, if, you're, um, if you have time. Um, we're not going to watch them now, just in the interest of time. It, it basically goes over uh, this. Uh, these basic steps. Afterwards, the ingot is tested to, for its resistivity, make sure that it has the properties that we're uh, looking for. These are wafers that you can buy. Uh, the wafers are doped usually N type or P type. Um, when you create your melt, okay, almost all of the melt will be silicon atoms. If you want to dope it N type or P type, what you can do is throw in some. Uh, uh, throw in some dopants, so you can throw in some column three out, uh, column three elements, or you can throw in some column five elements. This will actually dope the semiconductor. That doesn't make sense to you right now because you don't know what doping is, but it's a very important uh, part of semiconductor devices. We'll talk about that in the next chapter. Um, the common diameter that you can buy wafers in is 50, 70, 30, 100. 
and then we all the way to the future where we can't remember the code to kind of describe what type of wafer um, it is. So you can buy one to zero wafers, one, one, one wafers. Uh, these numbers uh, are actually the real <coughs> index of which plane the, it is cut from. So let's say you grow a silicon crystal. You could cut the silicon ingot, you know, this way. Let's say the cylinder is like this. You could cut it horizontally like this. Um, that will give you uh, the typical one zero zero crystal. Um, and that's where you can all, all the tension of the devices. Uh, you could also cut it slanted at a, at a specific angle, which will give you uh, what's called a one 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 wafer. Um, this actually has a higher density of atoms on the surface than um, the one zero zero wafers do. And so they have slightly different electronic and mechanical uh, properties. Uh, you know, this is not too important for, for the purpose of this class. Uh, for most electronic devices, you know, one zero zero uh, wafers are used. And this is just a notation that uh, the way that they're, um, instead of actually writing out here, uh, this is the PCAT one zero zero wafer. If you wrote on it, then you're going to have to scratch the wafer, right? So the, the notation that they use is they have to use this a wafer flex. They will actually cut one side of the wafer like that. If you look at a single flat on uh, the way to that means it's a one zero zero P type wafer. Um, a one zero zero N type wafer will actually have just one big cut here and another big cut on the outer side. It's just a color. So over time I mentioned that um, <coughs> the uh, the size of the wafers is growing. If we look between the nineteen sixties when Microfabrication uh, was just getting its start, and where we are now, you'll see that the average wafer size has gone from uh, 38 or 51 millimeters, which would be probably about this big, um, and they've gone to uh, 450 millimeters, which is larger than what this guy told me. They're literally the size of a people. Um, so why do you think that the size and weight is growing? What do you think is what they're driving this trend? That's right. They're just trying to protect. It's economic reasons. The more microprocessors or controllers, more devices you're able to fit on a single wafer. Um, it, it basically makes makes things cheaper to manufacture. Because remember, I showed you on that last slide. Um, you know whether you're whether you're using it this uh, wafer this big or you're using a wafer this big, it still has to go through those 200 steps to go from just a bare silicon wafer to one that has all the transistors made on. So as long as you're going to go through those steps, you may as well do it with a much larger wafer. Right. So the next question is, why didn't we just use larger wafers to begin with? Uh, no, the, not not quite, not quite. It, it, any any other ideas why? It actually, has to do with like more of a practical reason. Yeah, the, exactly. The production process wasn't reliable enough. When you're doing when you're working with a wafer this big, you know it's very <laughs> hard to get like the um, uh, the uniformity right. Okay. Whatever process you're doing, it has to be uniform over the entire surface. Because you need the chip on the upper right-hand side of your wafer to work equally as well as the, the chip on the bottom left-hand side of the wafer. Right. Uh, maintaining uniformity across such a large wafer size is actually quite challenging. When, when you start talking about the different semiconductor manufacturing processes, you guys will gain an appreciation uh, for that. So. Um, as the manufacturing technology has gotten better, as the tools have gotten better, as we figured out better ways to make it all the processes more uniform, we will start to we start to see a trend in larger wafer sizes. Um, in our clean room that we have here at Wayne State, we use five inch wafers. And in other research universities they use they use even smaller ones. When you're doing um, in in a lot of research labs where you're not making things in high volume, it doesn't make sense to use a gigantic 
wave for size. In those places, you'll see the wave for sizes are uh, much smaller. It's only in big production facilities that you see these gigantic wave for sizes. Um, there are some companies that have that facility here in the United States, but over the last couple, over the last decade or two decades, a lot of the semiconductor manufacturing has been uh, outsourced overseas to um, uh, a lot of it is in Asia. Um, I would say a good majority of it is, is in um, places like India, Singapore, and so on. Just because the um, cost, I guess the cost to do business there is less. But some of the manufacturing is actually coming back to um, the uh, United States. And it's by no means any kind of trivial matter. The people who are doing the microfabrication processes, the type of equipment that goes into these types of fa fabrication facilities is, is state of the art and you need, you need very good people in there. So uh, that's one of the reasons why it's important that we bring some uh, fabrication facilities back to the US. Uh, one more question, why is the guy wearing the suit? Um, it's because the guy who likes the suit, no particles on the screen. You know how, like, you know, your, your human hair is 100 microns diameter? That's, uh, that's 10,000 times larger than a transistor. So, one hair could wipe out 10,000 transistors on your robot. Um, so, the clean rooms, the places where they make these have uh, uh, hip, 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 uh, and uh, they're designed in a way so that um, all the particles will, you know, remove particulates from the air. The airflow in these facilities are designed in, in a way so even if the, a particle does get in, it'll be brought to the outside of the, um, of the areas uh, where they're doing a lot of the sensitive processes like photolithography and diffusion and etching and all that stuff. Uh, any questions on this? Okay, great. So we'll start.